Welcome to This Week in Morgan County. I'm your host, Russell Mokhyber. Our guest this week is Sarah Chase. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You have a fascinating background. You mean my raggedy CV? Is that what you're talking about? You're, the one with all the rips in it? Yeah, you know? but I mean, uh, where you were born, yeah. work of your parents, your life's work. Oh, right, in 30 in seconds, nutshell. right. No, I grew up in the Northeast in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the daughter of two people involved in the legal world. My father was a professor of international law. My mother has been a lawyer and been a professor, you know, most of my life. But they always made public service central to, like, basically the deal was be whatever you want to be so long mm -hmm. as it's constructive and of service to the public. Um, my father took the, for him, really extraordinary step of um, arguing a, a case in the world court against the United States. He was a very patriotic American, but this was the case of Nicaragua back in the 80s when the United States was, was mining the harbors mm -hmm. of the country of Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. and, and when asked, you know, how can you argue against your own country? His response was, I don't see anything wrong with holding the United States up to its own highest standards. And that's really kind of been a mantra, you know, it's kind of been a, a guiding wisdom for me. I um, studied history in school, I got into journalism, uh, radio journalism, covered the fall of the Taliban after 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, in Afghanistan and decided, and I'd been thinking this for quite some years already, like enough talking already, <laughs> you know, do something about it. You know, there's something about particularly foreign journalism, particularly I had covered Balkan Wars and um, absolutely horrific civil war in Algeria, um, and, and then the 9-11 and post-9-11 conflict, and you, you're making your living off of other people's drama, right? I mean, at some point it felt to me that you need to bear some responsibility for how the story comes out. So I stayed behind in Afghanistan. And when you were reporting, um, you were reporting for National Public Radio. That's correct. That's how I first heard. Yes, hear, that's, that's right. That's how probably a lot of people in our audience might remember that's right. for that's National right. Public Radio. I was NPR's Paris correspondent, um, uh, covered Kosovo and Post for National Public Radio, and Algeria also was for NPR, and went in to cover the fall of the Taliban, um, and then left, and left journalism because of what I just said. That, that I mean, as important as journalism is in shaping people's ability to um, evaluate what's happening in the world around them, it felt to me sometimes as NPR's Paris correspondent that I was kind of reporting on the foibles of well-to-do Europeans for well-to-do Americans, you know, and to what end. And so, and I felt that, that that moment in Afghanistan was so critical because again, with a background, my, my history background was actually Islam. And I felt like, wow, there are two really remarkable civilizations here Neither one of us is pushing the other one off the planet. Both of these civilizations have a lot to learn from and teach each other. And isn't this an incredible moment where we could try to make that happen? It, I fear it didn't, but that was, my, that was my motivation in staying behind. And so I ended up staying in Afghanistan for about a decade. And I lived in downtown Kandahar, which had been the Taliban stronghold. I speak Pashto. I, I learned Pashto. I ran a little uh, soap factory. <laughs> you know, we made skincare products out of local agricultural um, produce, um, seeds and nuts and botanicals and all that stuff because Afghans were saying, why don't you help us get employed? Why don't you foreigners make, help, you know, expand the economy? I mean, expand the economy. Jobs, we need jobs. It sounds kind of familiar, right? Um, and so I, said, okay, if that's what they want, let me try to do that. Um, but it was a very remarkable vantage point from which to observe what was going on. Because as I said, I spoke the local language, I lived downtown, I didn't have barbed wire or sandbags. And in the 20 men and women I had working with me, we had nine different tribes and ethnic groups. 
So it was a real diversity. Um, and we would spend the first part of every day metabolizing whatever had happened to whoever uh, or their family or their village or their neighborhood, you know, the previous day. And you were introduced there f firsthand to on the ground corruption. That's exactly right. So I went planning to, um, you know, help reconstruct the country. And almost immediately, the central problem that Afghans started talking about was abusive corruption. And it started straight away in like 2002 when the governor who had forced himself into the position of governor, which he had not been appointed to, so number one. And how did he do that? He had a militia around him of gunmen who had been equipped and, 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 and uniformed by the US military. Um, that allowed him to force his way in under threat of violence against his own people. And then the, that militia started shaking people down um, at every roadside. And, and so from the very beginning, people were saying, but if, if this new government uses its political power to steal from us, you know, that's not okay. And so I found over the course of the next three or four years that people started drifting back to the Taliban, not out of religious persuasion, because they liked that particular brand of Islam. They didn't, they hadn't enjoyed living under the Taliban, but the Taliban had been um, a government of law and order, uh, corruption when it was found was punished. It was not the system by which that government operated. And, and people were just beside themselves at being shaken down every time they interacted with any government official at any level at all. And, and they were also very confused about why the United States was allowing and apparently enabling this type of governance. And I remember people saying, you know, oh, well, that's just part of the culture down there. Come on, look at the neighborhood. That's, that's how people are. And I thought, wow, it's really interesting. Americans say that. But I haven't heard a single Afghan say, Sarah, get off your corruption shtick. That's just some Western, you're imposing Western values here. This is part of how we do things here. No, it was the Afghans who were screaming to me about it. And then I would say, you know, well, what, what does corruption mean? So you don't get from an uh, Afghan who grows grapes and pomegranates you know, on a dry plain who hasn't been to school and can't read and write, you don't get a dictionary definition. What you get is a story, you get a narrative. So he would say, when the district governor um, gets all of the development resources and surrounds himself with armed thugs so that we, the regular people, can't reach him to lodge our grievances, that's corruption. And you, you spoke about covering the fall of the Taliban, but now what, 17 year, years later, the Taliban is effectively back, back in That's right, but for this reason, not because, yes, my neighbors are very observant Muslims, my neighbors in Kandahar, everyone, we broke work five times a day for prayer. Um, they are observant Muslims, but they are not religious fanatics that they hated it when the Taliban would force people into the mosque at prayer time. The women hated it. One woman in my cooperative had put henna on her fingernails when they were in power and had her, she had bought something um, in a market stall and there was one of this, you know, the people, it's called the, uh, it's the re religious police basically, beat her on the hands because she had colored her fingernails. Like that kind of religious fanaticism they do not uh, subscribe to, but they were drifting back to the Taliban or certainly not willing to stand up against the Taliban when, as they put it, look at the Taliban, hit us on this cheek and the government hits us on that cheek. Like why should they risk their lives on behalf of a government that is as hostile to their interests as the Taliban are? And, and what was really remarkable is I was so deep down the Afghanistan rabbit hole for so many years that I thought this was an Afghanistan thing. And something occurred, I gave a talk um, before police and army officers from 45 different countries and I, 
I kind of sketched out how this works because it's not just the police officer or the doctor or the teacher who shakes you down. In fact, it's a system because the police officer at the street level actually has to pay part of his bribes up the line mm -hmm. or the customs agent or whatever. There's a, they have to pay their dues up the line and it's a lot of money when you put it together. Um, and in return, what they get is impunity. They get protection from any repercussions for the abusive behavior that they are, that they're doing. And so I was explaining that in this talk and I had a line afterwards of people saying, you just described my country. And I was like, whoa, because what were the, pe who was standing online? There was Nigeria, there was Central Asia, there was, and I'm like, wow, there's a extremist religious insurgency in Nigeria too, it's called Boko Haram. Wow, there's an extremist, like every country, suddenly I'm seeing this correlation between this type of, um, I want to say abusive um, systemic corruption and extreme reactions. And at the time I was really focused on religious extremism, but then we got the Arab Spring. Every one of those revolutions was about corruption. And we didn't hear that so much in the West because it kept being described as the youth bulge and unemployment and these kind of impersonal structural economic forces that no one can have anything to do with. But I was on the ground for a month in the first month of the Arab Spring across all of the North African countries, um, including Egypt. Um, and at the demonstrations, you saw specific ministers, pictures behind bars. It was very explicitly an anti-corruption Ukraine, anti-corruption. In the last, you know, and that overthrew uh, uh, corrupt, kleptocratic, autocratic um, ruler. And then in the last, you know, since 2015 or so, I can't name them all. I mean, Guatemala, Brazil, Honduras, uh, Peru, um, Burkina Faso, South Africa, Romania, Iceland, Malaysia, Lebanon, Iraq. I mean, the number of countries that have seen anti-corruption uprisings, many of which have actually toppled government leaders, is breathtaking. And they can be either right or left. That's exactly right. They can come from either way. And you wrote, you wrote uh, a book growing out of this experience called Thieves of State. That's right. And when you use the word kleptocrat, you mean government by thieves. That's exactly right. Government by thieves exists exactly right. And, and not only that, what I've started, and I got partway to this analysis in Thieves of State, but I've actually taken it a little bit further since. Thieves of State really tells the story that I just told, is how does systemic corruption lead to extreme reactions? And in particular, I focused on, I would say, militant puritanical religion. Um, and so I looked at the Islamic extremist movements, but I also looked at early Protestantism. I mean, just take a look at, you know, Martin Luther's 95 Theses. They're all about corruption. I was, I didn't know it at the time. And it was doing the research for that book. Now, I'm not trying to say that Martin Luther is the same as Osama bin Laden, but the parallels are a lot closer than I had ever imagined before I started working on that. But what I've found since then is I've been working on what does that kleptocracy, the word you just used, what does that actually mean? It's government by thieves, but it's very sophisticated. So I was just talking about the vertical integration mm -hmm. of this system. So if you're a little cop at street level, you're filling your pockets with people, you know, bribes that you've extorted from people. But in fact, you almost have to extort bribes from people because the salary is kept so low that you couldn't possibly live on that salary. So that's a decision by the government, essentially, that we're going to underpay our civil servants so they have to steal bribes and then send them up the line. And in a poor, poor country like Afghanistan, that amounts to, in 2010, between two and five billion dollars a year in extorted bribes in return for this impunity going down. But there's a horizontal integration to these networks also. So what I mean by that is like, like we Americans, we divide the world up often, well, we divide it up into good guys and bad guys. So there are licit actors 
And then there are illicit actors like criminals, drug traffickers, human traffickers, terrorists. You know, that's the illicit side. And then among the good guys or licit actors, I mean, we could get into a fight all day long about who's worse for your health, government or business, right? I mean, Americans see those two sectors as, as, as opposing each other and sometimes even antagonistic. The brilliance of these kleptocratic networks is they weave together all three sectors. So in Afghanistan, for example, the president's younger brother was the head of the provincial council in Kandahar. He also ran the biggest opium trafficking ring in southern Afghanistan. And he owned a lot of private construction companies mm -hmm. that were doing the infrastructure rebuilding. So you've got one single person who's a node in this network that weaves together um, these three sectors. In fact, if Loudmau Sarah Chase, the American living in downtown Kandahar, had gotten knocked off by some, tala, some guy with a black turban, no one would have thought anything of it. But it, it might very well have been some friend of Ahmedwali Karzai, the president's brother, you know, because they have pals in the Taliban, too. And that's a pattern that I saw again and again and again. Now, these networks, um, they are configured differently in different countries. So in Azerbaijan, for example, there, it's very centralized and a lot of overlap among these three um, strands. So the president's family owns 11 banks, for example. So basically the government owns the, quote, private banking sector. Um, in other countries, it might be more, um, a little bit more diffuse, a little bit more internal, sorry, in, a little bit more internal um, rivalry within the networks, which often, interestingly, is expressed by political parties. So it ends up that the political parties are only representing the kleptocratic network. They're not representing the people, but they're just representing different branches or slightly different, you know, different networks, and the people are left out in the cold. And so the people stop voting because they say, look, it, it's almost like a sports game owned by billionaires, you know, and and, and what difference does it make to us which of these teams wins? I'm thinking in terms of this interview, if you're okay with it, we'll do yes. the first part. Uh, this part will focus on corruption overseas, and the second sure. part will do corruption in the United States. Because sure. you're writing a book about corruption in the United States. That's exactly right. Okay, so let's just follow up a couple final questions okay. for this segment. Sure. Um, there's been... Can, can I just say yes. one last thing yeah. on these networks? So the point of the kleptocratic network is not to govern. Governing is the front operation. The objective of these networks is to maximize money in the pockets of network members. So they, they have a whole bunch of different skills and capabilities because they span these three different, you know, sectors, right? And so the role of government officials in these networks is to bend their agencies or their um, government institutions, not to serve the public interest, but rather to serve the interest of the network. And I've looked at what revenue streams do these networks capture in different countries. And depending on the country, depending on what its natural resources are, or its history, or its economic history, there'll be different revenue streams that get captured. You know, in Afghanistan, opium is a gigantic revenue stream. In Venezuela, oil is a gigantic revenue stream. Three revenue streams show up in every single country I've looked at, and they are energy, the banking sector, financial services industry, and high-end luxury real estate. You mentioned Brazil earlier, and yesterday there was an election in Brazil, and a far-right candidate uh, appears to be winning. Uh, and that was, when, when you read the interviews with people on the street, why, that was a response to corruption also. Exactly. And I, so the question I want to ask you internationally, and we're going yeah. to get to the United yeah, yeah. States, what makes a country move right or left in response to corruption? I don't think it's a question of right or left. I think it's a question of other than. So Brazil had been run for a long, long, long time by a left it goes, allegedly leftist, leftist People's Party. What I would like to point out is extreme voting. Mm 
So, you know, what I observed was that people subjected to systemic corruption react by going to extremes. They might join, you know, terrorist groups. They might have a revolution or they might vote for parties that are just off the map that you can't even describe as leftist or rightist anymore because they're just, they're demagogues. And what people are often voting for is anything other than the mainstream, this exchange between two different types of kleptocratic network. They want somebody who looks like they're totally outside of it. Um, and unfortunately, too often, it's demagogues who capture that anti-corruption indignation, be it demagogues on the left or demagogues on the right. And, and, and people who are voting for a wrecking ball you know, they're voting just smash this system that we have no recourse from. But unfortunately, it's those voters who often wake up the next morning with a smashed head. And so that is an overview of corruption worldwide, as you saw. It doesn't sound like corruption in the United States, but you're focusing on that now. In part two, we're going to look at that and get your expression on camera so we understand it for part two. Good setup. So stay tuned for part two. I'm Russell Mokhyber, and this is Morgan County, This Week in Morgan County.